true Christian faith overcomes obstacles. True Christian faith does not cease to exist, nor is it weakened by conflict. That's illustrated in the book of 1 Thessalonians. I've referenced in other messages on 1 Thessalonians that persecution forms the backdrop of this entire book as it does several others in the New Testament. There are nine specific verses that speak of persecution, of affliction, of pain, of suffering in this book of five chapters. And it forms the background of the hope that we have as Christians, and it also informs us as to the great and amazing nature of what happened in Thessalonica as people came to faith in Jesus Christ in the middle of a trying time. So I'd like to begin with an exploration of this theme of persecution in 1 Thessalonians and support it from some other passages of Scripture. But in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6, Scripture says, You became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit. The Thessalonian church was born in persecution. It came about in the middle of persecution. That's what's indicated here. They had received the word in the middle of much affliction. Now, this affliction that is being talked about here refers to great pressure. The Greek word thlipsis, which came into Latin as the tribulum. And then we get our word tribulation from that. That is one of the most frequent translations of the word thlipsis, tribulation. Here the choice was made to translate it affliction. No real difference. But it's to indicate that this is severe persecution. Notice, in much affliction, in great affliction, or in severe persecution. It wasn't simply that people were mocking individuals who placed faith in Jesus Christ. There was a price to pay in Thessalonica. And still they received the word of God as the closing phrase of this verse says, with joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. With joy that the Holy Spirit imparts. And if you've known Jesus Christ, can you remember when you trusted Jesus Christ and the joy that the beginning of that relationship brought to you. Now the likelihood is that you are not facing great persecution at that moment. So perhaps the joy is of a different character, you might think. But these individuals did come to the Lord under great persecution. In reference to this, 1 Peter 1 verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, that is Christ, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. In spite of the fact that we don't see Christ, our faith in Christ connects us to him and gives us the ability to rejoice with a kind of joy that this world doesn't understand and that this world cannot produce. Do you know that the headlong search for joy is what prompts many people to sin in grievous ways? That even can be the case for a believer. As we stop finding our fulfillment in the fountain of blessing and in our Savior Jesus Christ and turn instead to the broken cistern of the world, our joy is to be found in Christ. Now, Paul tells us in chapter 2 of this book that he had boldly proclaimed the gospel of God, as verse 2 says, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with or in much contention. 
This word contention refers to conflict. And again, the same adjective is placed here that was in chapter 1 and verse 6 talking about the affliction. It is great, great contention or great conflict. This is the Greek word for conflict, agon, from which we get agony. It refers to the strenuous effort needed to win a contest such as the Olympic Games or even in war. That strenuous effort describes the conflict of persecution. That a believer comes to faith in Jesus Christ, comes to this gospel of God, or as I like to put it, God's own gospel, in spite of the great difficulty that's involved. Scripture says, that the kingdom of God suffers great violence, but the violent take it by force. It's often a verse that is troublesome to interpret, but I think here we have the context. It's not violence in the sense of being ruthless. It's rather in the sense of being undaunted, as I've titled the message, Undaunted Faith. That the kingdom of heaven is under great duress, opposition, there's great persecution. And it is the undaunted, the ones who are really willing to struggle through the, the opposition, who will inherit that kingdom. So Paul is preaching God's own gospel while the opposition raged. That's something that makes the faith of these people even that much more special. But not only that... Look down a few verses in chapter 2 to verse 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. This word, being taken from you, is a verb which is ap orphanizo. And if we just take the second part of that, orphanizo, kind of sounds like orphan. And that's what a literal rendering of the word means, to orphan from, with the apo on the front of it. In other words, a forced separation is what's being talked about here. They were, in a sense, orphaned by having Paul torn away from their presence. Paul was torn away, not simply taken away. And being torn away, separated by force, he couldn't even get back to visit them later. Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 10, tell us about Paul's encounter there in Thessalonica. And when you come down to verse 5, he describes the opposition that is being brought up. There's an unbelieving group of Jews connected with the synagogue in that city who incite a riot. They stir up apparently unemployed lowlives who are there in the marketplace. And these individuals attack the believers. In fact, dragging Jason and others before the rulers of the city. And undoubtedly, it's not the rabble that presents the accusation against these men before the leaders of the city. But rather the unbelievers who had stirred up the rabble. And they accuse the followers of Jesus Christ of sedition, of trying to replace Caesar with Jesus Christ. The result of all of that is that Jason is required apparently to pay some sort of bail. It says they took security of him. And then he's released. And believers then immediately send Paul away from the city, knowing it's not safe for him and for them for him to be present. So Paul goes on his way, having only been there a few weeks, maybe a few months. And the church is orphaned. They're left on their own. With this kind of opposition, you would expect that few people would come to faith in Jesus Christ. But incredibly, people trusted Jesus Christ anyway, in spite of the persecution. In Acts chapter 17, verse 4, if you look at that, Scripture literally says that some Jews from the synagogue believed a multitude of devout Greeks 
and many chief women came to salvation. In spite of, in the presence of, all of this opposition. And so a church was established. That's referenced in the first verse of this book. To the church of Thessalonica. So the Thessalonian church was born in persecution. The Thessalonian church thrived in spite of that same persecution. In chapter 1, verse 3, Scripture says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. The faithful work of these individuals was a demonstration of the reality of their faith in Jesus Christ. In spite of the persecution, their faithful work, their work giving evidence of their faith. And then he says also your labor of love, that is your arduous toil to the point of exhaustion in the work of God gave evidence of their love for Christ. Certainly not a love for persecution. No one likes pain. And yet these individuals persisted in serving God and were undeterred. And then their patience of hope or their patience, their endurance in the middle of the persecution gave evidence of their hope in Jesus Christ. Their confidence in eternal life and in his acceptance of them. Continuing on in chapter 1, we come to verse 6 and find that these people, by their imitation of Paul and Silas and Timothy, were a testimony to their fellow townsmen. And you remember that word imitation literally is mimites, to mimic. In verse 7, they became examples. And that was the impression left by striking a blow. That's what the word literally means, example. The blow struck was the persecution. And yet, that blow was undiminished because there had been a greater blow, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which affected their lives and left them transformed. And so they became examples to fellow believers throughout Macedonia and Achaia. Some of these other churches that Paul had established and so as Paul goes and visits them, he undoubtedly references what's going on in Thessalonica, and they've already heard the stories. And that's a motivation for other people to be more faithful. And then verse 8, their zeal, their evangelistic zeal, spread the gospel far and wide. Paul says, when we go to places, we don't even need to tell them about what's happened to you. They've already heard, and now we can preach the gospel. That's an amazing testimony from people who came to the Lord in the middle of persecution, grew in the Lord in spite of that persecution. And the fact of the matter is that Paul says, according to chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, that he had warned them ahead of time that persecution was coming. He warned them of a pen, impending affliction. Verses 3 and 4 say that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For truly, when we were with you, we told you before that we would suffer persecution or tribulation, even as it came to pass, as you know. So Paul's statement to them is, first of all, that believers should not be moved, literally should not be shaken when affliction comes. This is the same word we saw in chapter 1 and verse 6. The pressure, flipsis, tribulation. This tribulation, this pressure which is brought to bear on believers' lives. Peter has another way of describing it. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, he, Scripture says that we're not to think it strange when the fiery trial, which is to try you, comes upon you. That's his description of persecution. And he says, don't think that fiery trial is strange. The word literally means foreign. Don't think of it as something foreign to your experience, something you shouldn't have to go through. No, this is a part of the Christian experience. And how does he say we should respond to that? Verse 13 of 1 Peter 4. But rejoice inasmuch as 
as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. The believer should rejoice, a word that occurs nine times in the book of Philippians. Philippians, that joy is made so much more real by the fact that persecution is mentioned even more than nine times in the book of Philippians. So if you're going to understand the theme of Philippians, it's not just joy or being joyful in the Lord. It's being joyful in spite of persecution. That's the lesson. And here again in 1 Thessalonians or in 1 Peter chapter 4, the same lesson is being repeated time and time again. Don't think it's strange when the fiery trial of persecution comes your way. But rejoice. Rejoice knowing that you are sharing Christ's own sufferings. The word sufferings refers to pain. Remember in Acts chapter 9 on the road to Damascus when Paul hears the voice from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ saying, Why, Paul, do you persecute me? That's a statement of Christ's identification with the persecuted church. He feels their pain. In another passage, Paul says that his persecutions are filling up what is still lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Those thoughts are foreign to our way of thinking here in the United States of America where tribulation causes us, instead of rejoicing, to cry out, my rights, my rights. Not quite the response scripture commands. Rejoice, you're participating in Christ's sufferings so that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. So when Christ comes back in his glory, you can rejoice knowing that you participated in those sufferings and you remained faithful. The next verse makes it even more unattainable or so it seems to us. If you re are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. Now this word is makarios. The same word that in Matthew 5 and verse 11 is translated blessed or blessed. Blessed are the persecuted for Christ, for they will obtain mercy. The persecuted church is happy. That doesn't mean that persecution makes you feel happy. It means that you are really blessed. You're partaking with the sufferings of Jesus Christ. But notice how Peter expresses it in verse 14. You're happy, you're blessed if you partake of the reproaches of Christ. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Or as I placed it in the notes, God's glorious spirit rests on you. You should be happy in persecution because God's glorious spirit then rests upon you. What an amazing comfort that is. Back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. The latter half of verse 3 says, For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto, or to this thing, to this persecution. Believers are appointed to persecution. They are set, is another way that this word is translated. They are set up for persecution by their association with Jesus Christ. It also connotes to be called to this. And there are two interesting verses. We won't turn to them. I'll challenge you just to write them down. You can look at them a little bit later. 1 Peter 3 and verse 9 says that believers are called to persecution. Now that verb called is kaleo, which is the same verb that refers to our calling to faith in Christ in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9. We are called to be Christians and in the same way we are called to persecution. How will we respond if it comes our way? So Paul, when he tells them all of this, he told them persecution was going to come. It was inevitable. Verse 4, when we were with you, we told you before. In other words, before the persecution came, we warned you that tribulation would come. They were warned about it before it appeared to prepare them for that persecution. Persecution. 
As we've seen in several passages, our reaction to persecution is already prescribed in Scripture. I'd like to point us to one other verse that gives us a detailed list, four points about how to respond to persecution. Matthew 5, verse 44 says, Love your enemies. That is, those who have made themselves your enemy for the cause of Christ. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who despitefully use or unjustly accuse or persecute you. That's a high ideal. That's not human nature. It's tit for tat that is human nature, isn't it? And yet... God's word says, as you're suffering persecution, have only good thoughts in mind. Not vengeance, not even thinking about God exacting vengeance on the persecutor, but on God showing mercy and bringing this person to faith in Jesus Christ. Or as 1 Peter 2 and verse 23 says of Jesus Christ, he committed himself to him who judges righteously. And that should be our response as well. So, when persecution came to Thessalonica, they received the salvation that is in Jesus Christ with joy. They grew in their faith. They shared their faith with anyone who would listen. And so I ask, what will happen if persecution should come to us? Will we respond as these believers... Will our faith be confirmed in the middle of persecution? Will we respond in joy? Or will we respond in belligerence, exerting our rights and defiling the name of Christ? May God truly give us grace to see that persecution is promised. It is part of the package deal of knowing Jesus Christ in truth. Undaunted faith. These were true believers. That's the model we follow in the church of today. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the great liberty and freedom you've given us here in the United States of America to the point that few of us has even suffered public ridicule, much less flogging or any kind of physical or even legal pain. There have been individuals who have lost their jobs for their faith in Jesus Christ. There have been individuals who have faced ridicule in the public scene, but usually, by and large, we're probably not among them. Father, give us the preparation of mind and of heart to understand that our relationship with you can grow in the middle of persecution. That persecution is your own suffering, your own pain. Lord, may we desire that the spirit of glory and of God or the glorious spirit of God would rest on us as we face persecution. May we not run from it. May we embrace it, not seek it out by foolish conduct, but rather live a life so openly Christian that persecution can and will come simply on the basis of the Christ-like character that we exhibit. Lord, we ask that you strengthen your church here in the United States of America for days of difficulty that may well be ahead. Give us grace to do what is right and to do it in the right way. Give us the joy, the happiness that should be our lot knowing Jesus Christ, whether persecution exists or does not. We thank you for your word once again and ask that you help us to meditate on it day and night. For Jesus' sake, amen.